Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for your love for us. Thanks for uh, the birth of Jesus. Thank you for um, just giving us a life beyond the grave. I ask that you will bless us now as we think about what really happened on Christmas. Help us to understand you better and know your love for us even more. In Jesus' name, amen. I know that many of you are on Christmas break, you students, and you're not thinking about schoolwork, but is it okay if we have a little Christmas quiz this morning? Would that be all right? There's like 15 of you that said okay. <laughs> is it okay if we do a little Christmas quiz this morning? Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, question number one. I think you guys can do well on this. Number one, which very old holiday has been celebrated for centuries on the 25th of December and is characterized by the custom of exchanging gifts? What is it? No, it's not. I'm sorry. It's the Roman festival of Saturnalia. Don't you know these things? December 25th is not Jesus' birthday. He wasn't born on December 25. Let's try question number two. You can get this one. Here it is. Question number two. Name this man. He's jovial and friendly, elderly, of heavy build, with a long white beard. His color is red. He rode in a chariot pulled by creatures with names like Cracker and Nasher. The fireplace in every home of humans who love him is an especially sacred place. He's said to come down the chimney on visits to human beings. Who is he? Uh, nope, it's not Santa Claus. It's the pagan Germanic god Thor, the god of fire. Last question. You can get this one. You're going to get this right. Are you ready? Here it is. Question number three. What green plant with white berries provides a place beneath which friends or foes may exchange a kiss, a tradition begun by Christians in the celebration of Christmas? What kind of plant is it? It is mistletoe. You got one of three. Good job. But it was first used as a truce site by the ancient Druids of Britain. So if Jesus wasn't born on December 25, and Santa Claus and mistletoe are really just pagan traditions, then what really happened on Christmas? Well, the first clue to, to figuring out what happened on Christmas is hidden in the timing of the job of one of the Old Testament priests named Zechariah. And we're going to find out today, in fact, in Luke chapter 1, we get our first clue. Luke chapter 1, starting verse 5. All the texts are on the screen today, so we'll cruise right through them. Here's what it says. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. What priestly division was it? Abijah, you'll have to remember that. A few verses later, it continues. When Zechariah's time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. So in the Old Testament uh, model of the sanctuary and, and the continuing model, there were priests, different groups of priests, put in different divisions or, or courses, groups of them, and they would take turns as they would go and serve in the temple. What an honor that they get to do this. Now, Zechariah was in the division of what? Abijah. Well done. You guys are acing this today, except for the quiz. Not so great on that. It's okay. Abijah, yes. And we know when that group, that course, that division got to serve in the temple. First Chronicles tells us right here, the seventh division was to Hakaz and the eighth division was to Abijah. So we know that the eighth group of people that got to go and serve in the temple was when Zechariah got to do that. Now, here's how the courses would work. The Passover was in the last of the third week of April. In fact, here's a picture of the, the uh, not that picture, nope. <laughs> and there, there'll be a calendar up here in a second and you'll see April. So Passover always happens in the third week of April. So it lasts a week. And so the very last week of April is the first priestly course. So you go on to, the, to May. You've got the second priestly course in the first week of May, the third priestly course in the second week, the fourth priestly course in the third, the fifth priestly course in the fourth. We go to June. You got the sixth priestly course in the first of June, the seventh in the second, the eighth priestly course, that's Zechariah's turn, in the third week of June. He does his duties there at the temple. He serves the Lord. He does whatever they had to do. He goes home to his wife, hasn't seen her in a while, and Elizabeth becomes pregnant in the last week of June. Are you with me so far? 
Are you with me so far? Okay. Let's, let's jump, jump story a little further forward. Luke 1, moving forward in the verses, verse 26 says these words. Oh boy, we got, we got issues. All right, I'm just going to read it. If you can't read it from there, then I will read it right here. Here's what it says. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was? Yes, you know the story. Mary's there. The angel comes and he says, surprise, you're going to have a baby. It's also going to be the son of God. And she sings this beautiful song, the Magnificat, and she's rejoicing that God is going to use her. That happened in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. We know when her pregnancy started, the end of June. So all you have to do is move forward six months to understand when this happened. It would be the fourth week of December. Now, here's what the next text says, Luke 1, verse 39. Mary got ready. She hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, "'Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear.'" Mary walks into the house, and she says, hello, I'm here. And Elizabeth says, you're pregnant, and you're going to have the Messiah. And it's in that time that Mary became pregnant with Jesus. Maybe it was the day before or a few days before, but it was right in there where Jesus was conceived. And when did the conception take place? All you got to do is look at the calendar. Elizabeth became pregnant the end of June, so one month would be July. The next month would be August, two months. The next month would be September, three months. The next one would be October, four months. The next would be November, five months. The next would be December, the sixth month in Elizabeth's pregnancy when we know that Jesus joined the human family. What happened on Christmas? Did Santa Claus come to town? Was Jesus born in a manger? God entered the human family on Christmas. God became human on Christmas. And although it's a way less important event, if you want to know when Jesus was born, all you'd have to do is fast forward about nine months from the end of December, and you find out that Jesus was probably born towards the end of September. So God became man on Christmas. But have you ever noticed the parallels between his his birth and his death? I mean, let's think about it for a minute. Just like Jesus was rejected on the welcome mat at the inn in Bethlehem when the innkeeper said, there's no room for you, go somewhere else. He was rejected in Pilate's court as all the people said, crucify him. Just like Jesus, who was born in a stable, but not like a barn that you would imagine. It was probably a hollowed out cave. In fact, if you tour Bethlehem, you you can see these places where they're, they're caves that are dug out. And it's this place for a stable where you'd put animals. Just like that cave in his death, he was put into a tomb. In fact, you could almost say that Jesus was born in a tomb. When Jesus was born, they wrapped him in swaddling clothes, those little bits of linen that were wrapped around his little body. And in his death, they wrapped his body before they put him in the tomb with the same kind of swaddling linen clothes. Just like when Jesus was placed in the manger, that probable stone-carved, cut-out trough for animal feed as he laid there in that stone enclosure. In his death, he was put into a tomb with a large stone that held him there as well. Or what about Joseph? When he was born, his earthly father, Joseph, was there watching over him. And in his death, Joseph of Arimathea was there as well watching over him. Everything in his birth was symbolic of his death. That's what really happened at Christmas. Love came down 
at Christmas. From the virgin womb to the virgin tomb, love came down at Christmas. There's a painting in in a cathedral over in Europe somewhere. It's a beautiful picture and the scene is Mary. She's on one knee and she's looking up a hillside to a little boy, Jesus, who's running down towards her. It's a beautiful sunny day and she has her arms wide open waiting for her son to come barreling down into them. And as she looks up, there's Jesus. He's coming down the hill and he has his arms outstretched and he's racing to his mama. And as the sun beams from behind him, the shadow in front of him forms a giant cross as he's running in the shadow of the cross. Everything that Jesus did from the moment he was born till he died was living in the shadow of a cross. In fact, Ellen White, one of my favorite authors ever, she writes in Desire of Ages, she says these words, even before he took humanity upon him, He saw the whole length of the path he must travel in order to save that which was lost. The path from the manger to Calvary was all before his eyes. He knew the anguish that would come upon him. He knew it all, and he did it anyway. Love came down at Christmas. He came to die. He came to live and know what you and I go through every day so that he could take the punishment for our sins and take it to the grave. And that's just it. Jesus joined the human family and experienced it just like you and me. Hebrews puts it this way. Here's what it is. Since the children have flesh and blood, that's you and me, Jesus too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. He knows what it's like. He was a teenager too, you know. While everyone else was getting knocked up and getting doped up and getting high and getting wasted, he chose to stay pure and clean and keep his eyes focused on the mission to save humanity. He knows what it's like. He was a griever too, you know. He lost his earthly dad at some point. At the crucifixion scene, Joseph's nowhere to be found. We know Joseph was much older than Mary, uh, but I wonder how he died. Was it cancer or Alzheimer's or Parkinson's? It doesn't really matter, but what matters is that Jesus knows what it's like to lose somebody you love. He knows what it's like to be single. His whole ministry, he was singled out and pushed out and alone. He never dated. He never married. He knows what it's like not to be able to share life with someone special. He knows what it's like to have a dysfunctional family. We know he had brothers and sisters. We don't hear too much about them in the Bible, and it makes me wonder why. Did they have embarrassment or shame towards him? Was their lack of faith in him so much so that they mocked him and laughed at him? He knows. He knows what it's like to be tired. His whole ministry was spent going from city to city, traveling, teaching, preaching, healing, equipping, training, modeling. He knows what it's like to have human fatigue and exhaustion. He knows it all because he was one of us. He knows it because he took the crown of the king of the universe off so that he could put on the cross to save the universe. There's a story that's very old and probably not true. It's the story of Freddy. Freddy's just a little boy. He's just an orphan. He's been bounced around from different homes different orphanages. He gets moved to this new orphanage and as he comes to the front door, the the ornery old matron, she comes to the front door and she says, what is your name? And he says, I'm Freddy. And she said, well, come with me, Freddy. She grabs him by the hand and she hauls him up the stairs and into the big hallway that's the bedroom for all those boys. And there's rows and rows and rows of cold steel beds 
She marches him down the hallway until she finds one bed that's empty, and she says, Freddy, this is your bed. Get unpacked quickly. Supper is almost ready. So he puts his bag there, and he sits on the bed. His feet don't even touch the floor, and he just looks at his shoes. A few minutes later, a bell rings. All the boys snap to attention. They straighten themselves up, and they stand at the foot of their bed, and the ornery old matron, she comes in, and she starts inspecting them head to toe, making sure their faces are clean, making sure their, their hair is combed, making sure they're looking presentable for supper. And she's going down the row, and she's looking at each boy, and she, she gets to Freddie's bed, and he's nowhere to be found. He's gone. She looks around, and she says, where's Freddie? And all the boys point under the bed. And she says, Freddie, are you down there? There's no response. Freddie, come out right now. It's time for supper. There's no response. Freddie, if you don't come out right now, I'm going to go get the headmaster. Freddie thinks, if, if she's this mean, how much meaner could the headmaster be? He can hear her footsteps walk away down the hall. And a few moments later, he looks out from under the bed and he sees two legs standing there with sharply creased suit pants. Oh, that's an expensive suit. A tailor must have made that. And those shoes, they're so shiny. And he hears the voice of the headmaster and the headmaster says, hey, Freddy, are you hungry? Would you like to eat at my table tonight? Freddy doesn't say anything. Then the headmaster does something that you'd never think he'd do because he, he kneels down. And he looks under and he says, Freddy, you can eat with me. Freddy looks over at him. The headmaster lays down on the ground with his suit on and he squishes his way back under the bed right next to Freddy in the dust and the dirt, shoulder to shoulder lying there, and they're just quiet together. A few moments later, the headmaster feels something in his hand, and it's the little boy's hand, Freddy's hand. He doesn't say anything. He just lies there with him. Finally, he says, Freddy, are you ready? Freddy says, I think I am. And the headmaster picks up Freddy, and he takes him to the dining room where he eats dinner with him. And that's what happened at Christmas. Love came down at Christmas. Love joined the human family to experience, to live, and to die. Love came down to you and to me at Christmas. It's the gospel message. It's the message that saves sinners like you and me. It's the message that the worlds around us Look, and they can't understand why a God would die for humans. This morning, I don't want this message to be more than just information. If it's just info, then we wasted our time today. But I wonder if there's some stirring in your heart and your soul. Maybe it's just wonder at who God is and how he could love you so much. And so to close today, I don't want to have an appeal where you come forward or raise your hand or stand or fill out a connection card. Instead, I'd love for you to spend some time talking to the one that loves you more than you'll ever know. So we're going to close with prayer. And, and as we pray, I'm going to invite you just to take the first 30, maybe 45 seconds, and it'll feel like an eternity, to just tell God how much you love him. So why don't we pray together as we close? Heavenly Father, we sure do love you, and it's because you love us first. And so, God, in the middle of this prayer, I'm just going to be quiet as you listen to the hearts and the voices of all those that are, are speaking to you.
God will never understand why, but we're so thankful that you joined this human family to save us forever. God, we love you, and we can't wait to see you. In Jesus' name, amen.